Can't decide in torn between a romantic, comedy, action, or an indie film to watch for the weekend? Well, well, well. Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast is your ultimate guide to the latest movies. Join us as we dissect the latest on the blockbusters. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stacey, and today we're talking about two films involving young boys or young men uh, befriending and or making pets out of animals that, by all assumptions, should probably be trying to kill them, but aren't. So our first film today is Alpha. This is the new, I don't even know quite what to call it, it's family-ish. I guess, but it has a PG-13 rating, and that's probably mostly from the first 20 or so minutes, in that this is set, it says at the beginning of the film, in Europe 20,000 years ago. It's not specific where to in Europe, it's just somewhere in Europe. And interestingly, even though I totally saw the trailers for this and immediately thought, ah, that's something you know, aimed at families that parents would want to take their kids to, even though I didn't know at the time it had that PG-13 rating. This film is not in English in that it is and it isn't because it's set in sort of the, they're not cavemen. They are actually like living out on a field, not a field. They're out living in tents. They're not living in caves, but it's clearly, you know, sort of prehistoric. You see at the very beginning, there are woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos i don't know enough about like ancient animals to quite know what's going on there with rhinos that also seem to be woolly as well but they're using i'm not even sure what language at the end in the credits there is a credit for a language consultant and in looking it up it seems that this was just sort of a created language so the entire film is actually in subtitles which kind of throws me off because on the one hand, American audiences just in general often aren't that fond of films with subtitles, but for children especially, I'm just like, really? Huh? Uh, okay. I mean, you're trying to be sort of, I won't even say authentic. You're clearly trying to portray the story as you're imagining it. And this is only something we can imagine of how, you know, wolves became domesticated and that's how we all got you know dogs as pets but huh you just were like nope we're not even going to put this in any language whatsoever we're going to create our own based off of i'm not sure what all the languages of europe as they currently stand because when they start talking it at first sounds a bit like french but then also russian or maybe romanian somewhere in the sort of eastern european thing But then other times it sounds like Italian and I'm like, so you just what kind of pick and choose from all the European languages? Like you kind of, it sounds like at times you're just hopping around, but you do get the subtitle so you can at least, you know, follow along with what the characters are saying. But this is the story. The boy's name is Kita and he is the son of his tribe's chief and they are preparing for their yearly great hunt where they go and hunt bison. And this involves, you only take the, I guess the test for this is you only take the people who can make the sharpest spearheads because that seems to be what the test is. They have a certain amount of time in which to create spearheads and then the chief and his second, I guess, go around and check the spearheads and see if they're sharp enough. And only this year, Kita and one other boy are considered, you know, to have met the whatever, to go off on the hunt, which takes like a week or more to get to. Like you get, you start a little in ahead and then you go to like a week before. But as you see them walking on this hunt, it actually at one point becomes just sort of 
a flyover montage where we sort of zoom over the landscape as the light is very quickly going daylight, night, daylight, night. So it does look like it takes about seven days. And I'm just like, why are you where you you are for your tents if your hunt is like seven days away? It's like you couldn't be any closer to your... Okay. But then something happens at this hunt, which leads the tribe to think that Kida is dead or if he's not dead, he very will soon be dead and there's nothing they can actually do to get him help. So they just sort of leave him essentially being like, he's gone on to the spirit world or it will soon enough. So essentially, we're just going to say he's gone to the spirit world and they go back home after the hunt. Kida then is left on his own and injured to try and find his way back to his family. And thankfully, on his way to the hunting grounds, was given a tattoo of the, I guess they're con- of a constellation, though I'm not sure which constellation it would be, um, so that when he puts his hand up to the sky, if he li- lines his hand up with those stars, that will sort of tell him which way home is, what direction home is from where he is. So thankfully, he at least has a general idea of where he's going, but he is injured, and along the way comes across a pack of wolves who attacks him. He attacks one of them back so that that wolf becomes injured. And then once all the other wolves are gone, rather than killing it, because as we've shown by this point in the film, Kida's not really a killer. There's a point even where he's supposed to be go right before he leaves on the hunting trip. His mother and father are having a whispered conversation in which his mother says that she's worried because he doesn't lead with his spear. He leads with his heart. And we see that he isn't really someone who easily can kill things. So he comes across this wolf. He does stab it with a knife because it's trying to like attack him. But then once it's just him and the wolf, he, for some reason, decides to pick up the injured wolf and take it with him to a cave and help heal it as you do with the thing that tried to kill you. Like, I get that there had to be obviously somewhere in human history some person was like hey so those wolves which i totally normally think of as dangerous eh, they're not so bad i'm going to raise and train one but seriously like i kind of half expected the story to be like oh i found a wolf cub that seems to have been abandoned or i killed its mother or something but I'll raise the baby wolf cub and therefore it'll grow up not trying to kill me. And so that's how we'll, you know, become man's best friend. But no, we're starting with a grown wolf that did actually try and kill me. But, oh, I also kind of tried to kill it. So we're in the same position of both being injured and both being away from our families. And if, you know, we very well could die out here. And so I guess that's somehow the connection or something that he finds. And then decides to take care of this wolf and the wolf in turn decides to, you know, sort of follow him home and you get this adventure as they're trying to get back to Kida's tribe. I will say again, I think the PG-13 rating for the most part comes from the first 20 minutes, not even so much about the animals because there is some killing of animals because these are hunters, but more so for Kida and how he gets into the situation where he's left by himself he clearly has much greater pain tolerance than I would because there are some things in here where I'm like, A, that whole situation in which we get him into a, a, a place where it seems like he's either very, he either is dead or very will, very soon will be, A, he actually probably should have died like five times over as we get through that whole situation. But then B, he does at one point actually have a broken ankle, which he then snaps back into place himself. I'm not even quite sure that's how ankles work. It looks like this ankle is broken. And I don't know if you can like pop your ankle out of joint, but whatever he does, he does. And there was just like, there's a huge, uh, about a five, 10 minute period when we're dealing with this whole thing of he's not dead, but he should be. But how does he, you know, with his injury start getting home where I was just sort of squirming at times. It was just like, oh, okay. Oh, and oh, and continuing with the, yeah, uh, I clearly don't have that great of pain tolerance. I could not snap probably any out of place bone back into its joint by myself. I just, no. But beyond that, there's not too much that would be sort of worrisome for children. There are still uh, wild, dangerous animals. 
trying to kill them as they make their way back along this path, which, and I get he's in a situation where you really have no choice, but I'm amazed at him being able to make this journey because it's a week out with nothing by yourself where on the journey here, we've clearly seen, yes, there are totally things out there that want to kill you as you travel to the hunting grounds, but at least you kind of have your tribe along with you to help protect each other. But here he doesn't have his tribe. He doesn't even really have any shelter. So unless he finds a cave, he's just sleeping out in the open. And I'm just like, I am clearly a very much soft, coddled 21st century person because no, (laughs) it's just like, but how are you sleeping at all? Like I would not be asleep at all out in the open with nothing around me at night. But I will say, and again, they're totally completely imagining. So it's, you know, I don't know how much of history and archaeology has led us to be able to prove anything about this era and time. The night shots in this are actually beautiful because you're getting, you know, this is 20,000 years ago. We don't have cities. We don't have light pollution. So you can see the night sky amazingly. Lots and lots of stars. But the filmmakers have decided that because there's nothing to essentially block the starlight, you can also see, and I don't know astronomy at all. So I'm going to call them nebulas. The sort of, they're not just pinpoints of light. They're like the colorful clouds of gas that I think come from stars exploding or galaxies or black holes. I don't know. I did not study astronomy, but those sort of things you see in pictures of space at times where it's not just stars, it's something else with colors and they're, you know, they're pink and purple and teal. They're gorgeous. Whatever they are in this film, the night shots are absolutely gorgeous. That having been said, the other shots sometimes are a little confusing, particularly when you get to the enter thing that wants to kill them here. There is at different points in the film, I think there is a saber tooth tiger or just a regular tiger. I'm not sure again where we are in history. There's a whole pack of wolves. There's a pack of hyenas. And I only really know prior to this film, hyenas from Lion King. So I thought, you know, oh, it's a cartoon. They're a bit exaggerated. But having gone through this film, the hyenas do seem a little like crazy. Like they have that, you know, laughing sound that they make, but they're also at one point they like follow these two into a snowstorm. And I don't even know if hyenas would have been like native to that area, but I'm just like, really? Like you're going to follow them into a, like, it's a, almost if you think of like a sandstorm that just sort of appears on the horizon is coming towards you that, but with snow, I'm not from an area that has snow. So I don't know if that normally happens in snowy areas, but I'm just like, I, so my sense of, you know, survival is, is there really nothing else you could eat that you're going to follow them to a snowstorm? Cause that seems really bad, but yeah, creep, creepy, crazy hyenas with their laughing selves, <laughs> kind of terrifying. There is a, I want to say it's a panther. I'm not even sure what it is. There's a number of things that try to, to kill them as they journey home. But there's also a number of things where you're like, aha, I get, this is where we get the dog thing. Because this is a wolf. It's not a dog yet. We haven't yet fully domesticated it, but you do get moments where it does some sort of very typical cute dog things. And I'm just like, ah, yes, this is, I'm not even a dog person, but I can see why, you know, dog people especially would probably like this film. There's a sort of game of tug of war. There's a bit of a thing of fetch. He does teach it how to come when he whistles. Although the wolf gets trained very, very fast, even though this is a journey of like a week or so, this is still an amazingly quickly trained wolf that it goes from being something he's afraid might want to kill him to something he can whistle and it'll come and knows almost like, you know, to come in a certain way or to come this direction from a whistle. I'm just like, Okay, sure. There was also this really cute moment when they're still not yet, like they're both still very wary of each other of that thing has tried to kill me where he's going to give it, I think it's a bowl of water because again, he's for some odd reason decided to take care of the thing that's tried to kill him. And the wolf keeps growling and then not growling at him. And so it's like a uh, muzzle, I guess sort of curls up in a snarl and then comes back down and then curls up in a snarl and comes back down. I'm just like, you're adorably cute. I know I should be like afraid because, you know, 
growling as a sort of warning of don't come near me or I will hurt you, but you can't decide whether or not you actually want to growl at this boy. It's very cute. And then it ends in a sort of, aha, and see, this is where, you know, dogs became man's best friend. But as we get to that ending, it feels very rushed. I half expected there to be like some other adventure or trial they have to go through. And instead, we do actually get to the ending. And I'm just like, oh, we're okay. We don't have like 20 minutes left. Oh, I thought we went a little longer. This film, I think, is only about an hour 40 or so. So solid time frame, I think, for uh, families to go see. Again, once you get to the traveling together part, nothing really terrible, um, I think, for children. Save for, again, things are attacking them. And there is one moment that they come across something in the snow that might startle very young children. But other than that, I thought thought it was a decent film. Um, It's not, I don't think, a big name film. And I didn't recognize any of the actors. But I don't know. I think it would be probably something that I wouldn't mind watching on TV. I'll say that. So we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Movies Podcast. Our second film on this boy's best friend is clearly a wild animal that could totally kill him, is Duma. And I had not heard of this film before. This is from 2005. And it's a little strange in that I think part of why I had not heard of it before is it did not do pretty well at the box office. It only had a budget of about $12 million dollars. But at the box office worldwide, it did not even make a million, which is a little surprising because I think it's actually a pretty decent film. And I think it is based off of a true story. It is certainly based off of a book, but whether that book itself is based off of a true story, I didn't quite understand when I was looking it up. But this is about a young boy, Zan, and it's Zan, Z-A-N, but it took me until about half the film to get that because I kept thought I kept thinking they were saying like Sam, but this is taking place in South Africa. So I was like, is there an accent thing? And I'm just not fully getting, are you saying Sam? What are you saying? What is his name? He is, I think, returning from a fishing trip with his father when they discover a young cheetah cub in the road. The cheetah, his mother has been killed by lions because lions evidently hunt cheetahs. I guess. And he has crawled through a, um, it's not even a square. It's not even a hole. It is a square. Um, it's a wire fence that separates like the roadside from the, I guess the side with the lions and cheetahs and things that would kill the people driving on the road. Not quite sure, but it, because this is a cub, it is small enough that it basically was able to crawl through one of the squares in this wire fence and it comes across the road and is on the road when they come by and they decide to pick it up and take it with them and only later recognize that it's a cheetah, but then decide to still keep it because I don't know. Like they don't only, and it's not clear what year this is supposed to be. 
it, the, the, the car and tractors that they drive look somewhat oldish, but at one point we do see that the boy has a video camera, so it should be within, like, you know, a decade or two of when the film was made, you would think. But they never call anyone or take it anywhere. They just keep the cheetah with them and raise it. And I'm just like, okay, whether or not you think a cheetah is a thing to have as a pet, there's not like any law or requirement that you would have even thought, oh, hey, we should call animal control or whatever the equivalent would be for cheetahs in South Africa. Like, really? Okay, but go on, parents, let your son have a cheetah. But this actually, it's really adorable. I did not know too much about cheetahs before this film other than that you know they're really super fast and they are there is a point where the father and his son they have a motorcycle with a sidecar and they decide to see how fast they can che- the cheetah can go one day in this motorcycle and it gets up to like 80 plus i, I want to say kilometers do they use kilometers in south africa 80 plus whatever it is they measure per hour and it's just like yeah that's a fast thing and you're still not concerned about it they live on a farm and it's not clear that the cheetah who they named Duma, which comes from some languages word for cheetah ever kills any of the animals on the farm. He seems pretty peaceful and calm and doesn't ever seem to be a problem or dangerous, but that was just a wild assumption I think to make. But then something happens and the boy and his mother have to move to the city and obviously can't really keep Duma with them in the city, so the mom arranges for a person from an animal preserve to come and get Duma. But for reasons, that man cannot come for a couple of days, and in the meantime, the mom has to go, I think, get a job or something, and the boy has to go to school, where he's unfortunately picked on. So the cheetah ends up being left at their cousin's house. She's some sort of relation, though I'm not quite sure how Exactly. Um, She is, as I think anyone else would be, quite nervous around the cheetah. But it's sort of calm at first, and it does the wonderful, oh, you're really just a big giant cat, aren't you, of crawling on the couch and then starts chewing on the TV remote. But this, unfortunately, turns on the TV, which startles it. And as it continues to chew on this remote, it keeps changing the channel, which continues to startle it. So it Uh, goes towards the woman it's been left with as a sort of, you know, essentially, hey, what's going on? I'm freaked out here. That unfortunately completely freaks her out. So she runs out of the apartment and leaves the door open, as you do, which means then that Duma gets out and gets out so quickly that he's able to follow the mom as she goes at this time of day to pick up her son from school He gets to the school, everyone freaks out because there's a cheetah on the ground. The uh, boy, Zan, sees that he's there and is already very unhappy here. And he and his father had had a plan, you know, that now that Duma had gotten big enough, they were going to take him to a, I guess this must also be a nature preserve or just wild land up north where Duma could go and be wild because he really is still a wild animal, even if he himself has never really experienced that deep inside. He's still a wild animal and will know how to live as a wild animal once he gets there, is the thought. So the boy decides, okay, I don't want them to hurt Duma and I don't like it here, so we're just going to go. And he and Duma somehow get back to the farm where they were, take the motorcycle with the sidecar, and go off on this adventure to try and get to this northern land so that Duma can be free there. Along the way, they come across Ripkuna, who is a, I'll go with Drifter. We get his backstory later on that he left his family to sort of like seek his fortune or whatever in the world, but it's not clear if he's heading back towards them or where he's heading when he comes across them. They end up kind of trying, needing each other, and so they decide to sort of join forces for the time being as they travel wherever they're going, even though they weren't originally going in the same direction. Uh, Zan doesn't completely trust Ripkuna, but he's not exactly in a position at the start to be like, I don't need any help whatsoever. When he meets Ripkuna, he's sleeping in a 
abandoned or crashed airplane and he doesn't have any water and this is like if not in the middle of a desert he says it's a salt flat or something they're in the middle of so obviously he needs water at that point he and Ripkuna sort of band together. Ripkuna gives him water. He offers to give Ripkuna a, a ride on his motorcycle, even though at that time his motorcycle doesn't have any gas. But he's a smart boy, and he figures out a way to make a motor sail cycle. I don't need a sail motorcycle. I'm not quite sure what you'd call it. Out of a parachute from the plane and using the wind that naturally happens over these salt plains, they end up going through a couple of adventures, um, end up rescuing each other, but then get down to this point where they're near the end of almost their ability. They're getting close to where they want to go, but they're also sort of ending. They don't have too much left regarding resources to get where they're going. Ripkuna ends up saving Zan from something that puts Ripkuna's life in danger And so Zan, whose whole, again, ran away from home, his mother, his mother has no idea where he is. She ends up going searching for him. So we only get glimpses of her throughout the film. Zan then has to leave both Ripkuna and Duma to go and try and find help before Ripkuna dies. And then we get toward a sort of near the end and a somewhat resolution. I was a little upset at the end just because of There's a lot of, wait, seriously, you're not even going to try. You just sort of stopped with what you were doing from some of the characters that I was just like, huh, okay. But I am a little surprised that this film did so poorly at the box office. It evidently did not test very well when I forget which film studio it is did the test for it, which also surprised me because it seems just sort of like a typical family movie about a boy and his wild cheetah pet that I thought would have been done, you know, if not great, at least decent enough that it would have been worth putting it out in theaters. And again, 12 million, certainly much more money than I have, but 12 million for a movie is not that large of a budget that it couldn't even make a million of that back in box office is really surprising. And it got a lot of good reviews, like critically, I think on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 93 or a 90 something percent rating so it was considered pretty good but just people did not go see it for some reason I don't even remember hearing of it at all I had never heard of it till just you know the past few weeks when I was looking for something that would also go with alpha I was just like yeah but I don't want another film about a guy with a dog because I am much more a cat person so I was like is there a thing about a guy with a I don't know what you would do with a cat and like the guy, the first person to domesticate cats. I don't even know when in time that would have been. But yeah, so I think this is a a decent film. I could totally see it being one of those films that comes on TV all the time on like, um, I was going to say ABC Family and again, that's not what it's called anymore. But you know, one of those things that it's, it would just come on TV so much that it's so familiar you don't even think about it. A good, solid family film to sit around if you have younger children. Not young children, but probably, you know, ages six to nine or so, I think. I don't have children, so I'm making a very broad guess there. I'm a little shocked, again, that this was not more more successful of a film. I like a good portion of it. There's a part of it I don't fully understand because it is set in South Africa. And I think part of that, just being in a completely foreign to me land, was part of where I'm like, is this the 60s? Is this the 80s? What year is this? Oh, you have a video camera. So at least the 90s, right? Like, what year is this supposed to be? And you do get a very strong difference between Zan's life in South Africa And Zan is um, Caucasian, but then his life when he and his mom going from the farm to the city versus Ripkuna, who is uh, African, black African, and his life in the village. And you see this sort of wide stretch of 
South African society, I guess, including this one point where clearly they both understand, but I don't fully understand. They come across this party of animal enthusiasts. I'm not even sure what to call it. It's a bunch of people just sort of out on a nice fancy party or whatever looking for animals. They both clearly understand what this is. It's a little strange to me. I've never quite seen anything like that. But the way I think the the way they handle that situation is pretty well done. Zan's clearly a pretty smart boy. Ripkuna's not an idiot either. It's a very interesting pair they make, especially since they still sort of kind of don't trust each other, but learn to get along. And especially because they have a sort of, you're, I don't want to say you're standing in for me for something, but Zan has a thing with his father and Ripkuna has a thing with his son. And so them dealing with each other of the older man and the younger boy, it's sort of like, a, uh, I can see in you, you know, this person who I'm missing. So I thought overall it was a decent family film. So that is it for today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Movie Podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program